honored guests. My name is Mdun Duli, and I'm part of the education team here at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Welcome to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and to this very special International Holocaust Remembrance Day um, and special um, event here at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and the 78th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. January 2023 marks 78 years since the liberation of Auschwitz. The largest camp established by Nazi Germany. Auschwitz was a complex of camps, including a concentration camp, killing center, and forced labor camps, as well as over 40 sub camps. Your Excellencies, His Excellency Eli Belotakovsky, Ambassador of Israel to South Africa, welcome. His Excellency Andreas Pischka, Ambassador of Germany to South Africa, welcome. Siawa Mugela. Ambassadors, Deputy Ambassadors, and members of the Diplomatic Corps from various embassies that have graced us with your presence and support, thank you for being here today. We thank the United Nations for their continued support of our work and great work in South Africa, Africa, and globally. Each year, the United Nations commemorates and remembers the Holocaust and its victims and survivors on the 27th of January. The theme this year for the United Nations remembrance and commemoration of the Holocaust is home and belonging. We are grateful to have with us Mr. Masimba Daffy Renika, Director of the United Nations Information Center in Pretoria. Welcome, sir. And we'll also be privileged to have a video address from the United Nations Secretary General today. Director Tali Nate, Founder and Executive Director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Thank you. Thank you for your continued hard work to keep this great institution thriving. Thank you. Our sincere thanks to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for your continued support. We are pleased to have Janine Walter, director of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, who will also address us today. Thank you. Dear Holocaust survivors, all Holocaust survivors, but especially thank you with much appreciation for those who are present in today's um, program and event. Thank you very much, with much, much appreciation. Thank you for your continued willingness to share your extraordinary stories and testimonies. Thank you very much. We are honored to have today as our keynote speaker, Paul Salmons from the United Kingdom. Paul Salmons specializes in difficult, challenging histories, exploring con the continued relevance of the past in today's very complex world. He helped create the United Kingdom's National Holocaust Exhibition at the Imperial War Museum, co-founded the Center for Holocaust Education at University College London, and for 20 years played a leading role in the International Holocaust Alliance. He's also the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's first GODA Fellow, named after Holocaust survivors Leslie and Susan Goda. I will tell you more about Paul's work during the course of uh, tonight's event. Our incredible team of volunteers, thank you for your passion and commitment. Without you, this incredible institution would not be able to thrive as it does. I want to especially thank um, Mark Klein, our friend. Um, of Mark Klein Productions, who runs our technical operations of many of our live events as a volunteer and as a friend. Thank you, Mark. Thank you and your team for your commitment and support. It is very much appreciated by all of us. Thank you. James Erding, 
CEO and founder of Education Africa. We are also very happy to enjoy a wonderful, wonderful, fruitful, and long-standing partnership with you and with Education Africa for many, many years. Tomorrow, we will have another partnership event with Education Africa uh, with learners from the Masibambane College in Orange Farm who will visit the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and who will be part of tomorrow's Holocaust Remembrance Day education program. We look forward to many more years of partnership and friendship with you, James. Thank you. We are thrilled to have with us Mr. Leb, uh, Ms. Lebo Ledwaba from Miyagi, which stands for Music is a Great Investment. And this is a youth music school based in Soweto in Johannesburg. Lebo will bless us with her musical talent today, and I'm looking forward to that as we all do. Thank you, Lebo, for being here. At this point in time, it is my privilege to call upon um, His Excellency Eli Belotekovsky, Ambassador of Israel to South Africa, to address us. Dear Holocaust survivors and families, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Today, the whole world marks the memory of the Jewish people who perished during the Holocaust. This day is a memorial for the victims of those terrible times, but it's also a memorial for those that saved, that risked their lives by saving Jewish families and, and risking they're, they're basically their children and themselves. And also for the Jewish fighters that displayed a tremendous degree of heroism by fighting the Nazi extermination machine. During the Second World War, the Jewish people lost close to a third of the entire Jewish population in the world and more than 60% of the Jewish population in Europe. It is difficult to assess what a contribution to the humanity could have done by this immense human capital. The first head of Yad Vashem, Professor Ben Zion Dinur, had said, if we wish to live and to bequest life to our offsprings, if we believe we are to pave the way to the future, then we must first of all not forget. And indeed, we do not forget. We do not forget how Jewish communities that existed for centuries all over Europe were uprooted and millions of Jews were sent to their deaths. Some were transported directly to the death camps. Others were first taken to the ghettos and transit camps, and after that, to the death camps. This was a mass murder machine. It is ironic that railways, one of the most vivid symbols of progress of the humankind, had also played a major role in, worst, in world's greatest degeneration in which people had abandoned their human face. The railway car has become one of the symbols of the Holocaust. The Holocaust was a mass murder machine on an unprecedented scale. But also beforehand, and perhaps surprisingly after, we saw more cases of genocide. And of course, Rwanda is very vivid and clear, but unfortunately not the only example. The lesson that we learned from this sad history is that humanity, unfortunately, doesn't learn anything from history. The atrocities of the Holocaust should have prevented us from repeating them, but this does not happen. And murder of human beings only because of their ethnic origins, unfortunately, occurs time and time again. We as the Jewish people, as Israelis, we can learn one very disturbing lesson from history, 
that we are on our own. And we, cannot count, and we can count only on ourselves. The way our grandfathers and great-grandfathers ended their lives has happened because the world was in a position of an innocent bystander. And we are not going to repeat this part of our history. Even today, there are individuals, organizations, and even governments that call for the destruction of the Jewish state. They don't call themselves anti-Semitic, but at the end of the day, it is clear that the hatred towards Israel and calls for its destruction come from a purely anti-Semitic position. I want to conclude by saying that like the efforts of the Nazis, also these attempts are doomed to failure. We will continue to flourish and to remember. Thank you. At this point in time, it is my privilege to call upon His Excellency, Ambassador Andreas Peschka, Ambassador of Germany to South Africa, to address us. Thank you. Dear Holocaust survivors, dear fellow ambassadors, dear Eli, dear Talinets, um, dear Janine Walter from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, here in South Africa, there's a nice greeting. Sabubona. I like it very much. Literally translated, it means, I see you. But there's much more to it than that. It also means, I notice you. I am with you. I take time for you and your feelings, your story, and your life. Sabubona, I see you. The greeting reminds me of a novel by the Israeli author David Grossman, entitled, A Horse Walks into a Bar. In that novel, there's an evening at the theater in the Israeli town of Netanya. And this evening completely slips away as the stand-up comedian Dovela Grinstein not only tells jokes and anecdotes, but also presents his tragic family history as a kind of accusation that make, made the, or makes the audience stop laughing. His childhood friend, Lazar, who is sitting in the audience, asks him after the performance why he did it. And the comedian Grinstein answers him, I want you to look at me. I want you to see me, really see me, and then afterwards tell me. Tell me what? asks Lazar what you saw, Greenstein replies. Too often, ladies and gentlemen, we see and meet people, but we don't really recognize them or take time to appreciate the human side in them and their personal backgrounds. January 27th is a day on which we are all called upon just to do that. We are called upon to let the survivors of the Shoah tell us what terrible traces the national, national socialist racial madness has left behind. We are called upon to listen to them, to hear them, and to see them. I am therefore extremely grateful to you, dear survivors, Irene Feynman, Irene Klaas, Adi Wanda, Reverend Josef Matzner, Helene Sief, Helen Liemann, Lia Stermer, for being with us at this day of remembrance. This is how we can see you. This is how we can hear you. And this is how we can get to know your survival stories. 
All of this helps us to remember the victims of Nazi terror, the fate of millions and millions of innocently murdered women, men and children, mostly Jews, Sinti and Roma, homosexuals, disabled, prisoners of war, people whose lives were declared unworthy of life. No line can be drawn, no line of any kind can be drawn under this terrible German history. There must be no attempt to evade historical responsibility and stop remembering. Or as our federal president Frank-Walter Steinmeier said in the German Bundestag in 2020, and I quote, Time has power over us over our memories. It is up to us to resist. It is up to us to defend the memory and the responsibility that grows from it against any hostility. At this point, I would like to thank our host, Tali Nates, and all the team of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center for their tireless commitment and for the invitation tonight. As the German Embassy in South Africa, we are proud to have a good and close contact with this center of documentation and remembrance. We are also committed to support you with further projects and plans in the future. Because truthfulness and standing up against denial against trivialization and or against falsification of the Holocaust is a central concern of the federal government of Germany and should be a central concern for all of us. Your dear Tallinnates and the Holocaust and Genocide Center keep finding ways not to let the memory fade away but to keep the remembrance alive for younger generations as well. This is very important when it comes to sensitizing young people, even older people, against exclusion, against nationalism, against racial hatred. Contempt for human beings, violence and wars. We see that to this day and the ambassador of Israel has mentioned it. Always follow the same stereotypes, which we recognize in the example of the unique catastrophe of the Holocaust, committed in the name of Germany throughout Europe. In Germany today, there's a broad political consensus that remembering the Holocaust and dealing with it remains an ongoing task for politics as well as for society in all its facets. The federal government is therefore promoting memorial sites that often exist at the authentic locations of the crimes, such as several memorial sites in former concentration and extermination camps. Among other things, the federal foreign ministry supports annual exchange formats at the International Youth Meeting Center in Auschwitz. And again this year, we are participating in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance campaign to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Hashtag protect the facts, which aims, aims at countering denial and falsification of the Holocaust. Honorable Amb Ambassador of Israel, dear Eli Belotsyatsovsky, You know that we consider the security of Israel as a part of Germany's reason of state. We also resist any attempts to erode Germany's ties to Israel. When our foreign minister Annalena Baerbock visited Israel last year, she unequivocally distanced herself and us from the apartheid accusation against Israel as false and extremely counterproductive. 
on the occasion of this year's Memorial Day for the victims of National Socialism, the important German weekly newspaper Der Spiegel conducted a long interview with the Holocaust survivor Rachel Hannon this week. Rachel Hannon describes the unbearable cruelty with which her mother, her father, and her brothers were killed and how she survived with her two sisters. At the end of the interview, Rachel Hannon is asked when she broke her silence about what she had suffered. She replies, and I quote, early 1990s, a friend and neighbor persu persuaded me to speak about my experiences in the Holocaust and to take part in study tours to places of extermination. Since then, I have been to Auschwitz 15 times with Israeli students or soldiers. I wanted to overcome the hate and no longer struggle with feelings of revenge, but be happy. Mentally, I could have stayed in Auschwitz my whole life, but I escaped hell and now I am free." End of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, we owe it to Rachel Hannon and we owe it to all other Holocaust survivors to listen. We owe it to them never to forget. We owe it to them to hear and to see them. Sani Bonani, I see you. Thank you very much for your attention. At this point in time, it is my privilege to call upon Mr. Masimba Dafi Reniga, Director of the United Nations Information Center based in Pretoria. And then thereafter, uh, we will also uh, have the honor to listen to a video address by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Masimba. Holocaust survivors and their families with us tonight. His Excellency, Mr. Eli Belotsuk. Belotsuk, sorry, I'm sorry. Belotsuk Ambassador of the State of Israel. His Excellency, Mr. Andreas Pesky, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany. I also want to acknowledge the presence among us of Paul Samons, the chief curator of the exhibition Seeing Ashworths. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is my pleasure to join you this evening in marking this year's International Day of Commemoration in Memory of the Victims of Holocaust. The theme for this year's commemoration that the United Nations has declared is home and belonging. It is a fitting recognition of one of the communication priorities of the United Nations, that is our fight against misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech. Back in 1933, when the Nazi party took over control of the government and started putting its ideology into practice. One of its policies was to identify who could claim Germany as home and who belonged. According to the UN, the process of definition and exclusion went beyond legislation and propaganda campaigns of disinformation and hate. It was extended to state-sanctioned acts of terror that destroyed people's places of worship, livelihood, and homes. The definition of who belonged and who did not soon was soon extended to all who fell within the Nazis' expanding borders. 
As part of the UN's commemorative activities this year, our outreach programs are framed around what home and belonging meant to the Holocaust survivors in the immediate post-war years, and how the meaning of home and belonging has been challenged radically by the perpetrators of Holocaust. Our focus this year will zoom in on hate speech, misinformation, and disinformation. All around the world today, we witness how people with ill intentions exploit information with disastrous consequences for peace and security, human rights, and the achievement of sustainable development goals. To this end, the United Nations will advocate for the right of access to reliable information sources. We will urge technology platforms, especially social media, to review their business practices that allow them to profit from misinformation and disinformation, as well as hateful content. We need to place the victims and survivors of Holocaust at the center of truth-telling and counter the impact of anti-Semitism fueled by misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, and prejudice. That is the only way we can tell current and future generations the truth behind the Holocaust and the true meaning of home and belonging. I thank you. Today, we honor the memory of the victims of the Holocaust. We remember the six million Jewish children, women and men, as well as the Roma and Sinti, the people with disabilities, and countless others who perished. We reflect on the millions of individual lives cut short, the millions of futures stolen away. As we mourn the loss of so many and so much, we also recognize that the Holocaust was not inevitable. No genocide ever is. It was the culmination of millennia of anti-Semitic hate. The Nazis could only move with calculated cruelty from the discrimination of Europe's Jews to their annihilation because so few stood up and so many stood by. It was the deafening silence, both at home and abroad, that emboldened them. The alarm bells were ringing from the very beginning. Hate speech and disinformation, contempt for human rights and the rule of law, the glorification of violence and tales of racial supremacy, disdain for democracy and diversity. In remembering the Holocaust, we recognize threats to freedom, dignity and humanity, including in our own time. Today, in the face of growing economic discontent and political instability, escalating white supremacy terrorism and surging hate and religious bigotry, we must be more outspoken than ever. We must never forget, nor allow others to ever forget, distort or deny the Holocaust. Today and every day, let us resolve to never again remain silent in the face of evil and to always defend the dignity and rights of all. Thank you. Um, it is now again my honor to call upon um, the Executive Director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, Director Tali Nate, to address us. Thank you very much, our dear, dear Holocaust survivors. It's, it's wonderful to see you here tonight after a few difficult years where we were not together physically. Ambassador of Israel, Ambassador of Germany, dear Director of the uh, United Nations Information Center, Paul Salmons, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and your support to us, Ambassador of Norway, Deputy Ambassadors of Poland, of Austria, mem many members of the diplomatic uh, uh, corps and friends from Rwanda, from Armenia, from uh, uh, many, many other countries in the continent, in the world, and the many, many friends here in South Africa. Tomorrow, on the 27th of January, we will mark, as Du said, the 78th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz complex of camps. 
by soldiers of the 60th Army of the First Ukrainian Front that liberated the camps in 1945. We will welcome tomorrow 120 learners uh, and educators from Matsibambane College in Orange Farm, together with our partners from the UN and from Education Africa, uh, and we will learn together about the Holocaust and its lessons from keynote speaker Paul Salmon, who you will meet tonight. We will also learn from Holocaust survivor Irene Klaas tomorrow. We cherish this role as a center of education. We see it every day. Only this week we had probably close to a thousand school learners and students visiting our center. As a center of memory, education, dialogue, and lessons for humanity, for us at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, our activities go beyond this one day of commemoration. We are involved in education activities, 365 days of the year. Is hate speech, anti-Semitism, Holocaust distortion and denial, racism and xenophobia are sadly still with us, globally. In words linked to the Holocaust, to genocide or to Nazi Germany are abused politically every day by leaders such as Russia's Vladimir Putin that justified the invasion with calling Ukrainians Nazis and preventing genocide and Holocaust to the foreign minister Sergei Lavrov that was just here in South Africa, that justified the war against Ukraine. And amongst his words where Sowativ Zelensky is Jewish, Hitler also had Jewish blood, which is absolute rubbish. So our work is increasing, sadly. I wish we could do something else, but it is needed and we all need to find new methodologies and new ways to recognize the hatred and work together towards peaceful coexistence. After the war, of course, Auschwitz became a symbol of the Holocaust, so it's no wonder that that day was chosen by the United Nations in 2005, that day of liberation. However, today, with our survivors here, uh, I want to remind you that the Nazis murdered Jews in other killing centers, other five, actually, killing centers, Helmno, Belgrade, Sobibor, Treblinka, and Majdanek in occupied Poland. They also murdered Jews in hundreds and hundreds of other killing sites all around Eastern Europe. Such killing sites such as Babi Yar near Kiev, in today's Ukraine, Pona near, near Vilnius in Lithuania. And actually Jews were murdered everywhere, in ghettos, in camps. They were shot by the Einsatzgruppen. They were gassed in gas vans or in killing centers all around Europe, and actually also in North Africa, and in some other spaces and places in West and East Africa. So today is a day of reflection, when we remember the victims of the Holocaust, men, women, and children, who were targeted not because of something they have done, but just for being born Jewish, or a member of other groups targeted by the Nazis. So today is also a day to honor and cherish our dear Holocaust survivors 
who continue to share their painful testimonies, hoping that the world learn from their experiences and that such acts will not be repeated. And I would like to call to the stage, or just next to the stage, our survivors from Johannesburg that will light memorial candles together. They represent other survivors who live in Johannesburg but could not join us today. Irene Feynman, born Kraus. Irene was born in Shedham, in the Netherlands. She survived Vesterborg and Ravensbrück concentration camps, and then was taken by the White Buses rescue mission to Malmo in Sweden in April of 1945. When she came to South Africa, she built a wonderful family, children and grandchildren, and shares his story with many schools. Irene Klaas was born Irene Stieler. She was born in Łódź, Poland. She survived the Warsaw Ghetto, and after escaping the ghetto before the ghetto uprising of April 1943, she lived life under a Christian identity in Warsaw, uh, she suffered a short imprisonment in an inter internment camp during the Warsaw Uprising of August of 1944, and then hid in other places until liberation. Irene also came to Johannesburg and built a wonderful family, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Leah Sturmer. Leah was born Leah Corner. Leah was born in those times of the Soviet Union, but in an area that is today Ukraine. But under the control of Romania during the Second World War, she survived labor camps in Transnistria, a horrific and relatively unknown area. Uh, of the Holocaust, where she was liberated from. And Leah also built a wonderful family here in Johannesburg. Adi Wanda. Adi? Adi didn't speak until very, very recently. Only in the last few weeks we heard his amazing story. He was born in Vizhnitsia, Bukovina, then Ukraine, then under Romanian control, today in Romania. You know, the borders always moved uh, in those years. He and his parents were incarcerated in two ghettos and in a camp and were liberated from Chernovitz, Ukraine, in the end of the war. His daughter is here. He has a wonderful family here in South Africa, children and grandchildren. Helene Seif. Helene was born Helene Weissman. Helene was born in Brussels, Belgium. She survived in hiding, moving from place to place as a little girl until March of 1943, when she moved to the home of Josine Bobichev, a widow, with three children. Josine loved Helene and treated her as one of her children. Josine Bobyshev was recognized by Yad Vashem as a righteous amongst the nations. And we honor Josine and we honor Helene and your family that you built here in South Africa. Helene Lehman. Helene was born Kaluska, Helene Kaluska. She was born in Pultusk, Poland. She survived through escaping German-occupied Poland 
first to Soviet-occupied Poland. She was in Bialystok, Bialystok for a while, and then deported by the Soviets to Siberia. She suffered great losses there. She moved from Siberia to Kazakhstan, where she was when the war ended. She was married to Mendel Lehmann, an Auschwitz survivor who passed away some years ago. And lastly, but not least, lighting the large candle for all the babies that were saved miraculously, Reverend Joseph Metzner, who was born in Strasbourg, France, Alsace-Lorraine, France, and survived the Holocaust by being hidden in different con convents, moving between Lourdes, Po, and May in the Pyrenees. After the war, as a tiny child, he was retrieved from the coven convents, from his hiding places in 1945. And we honor you, your lovely wife, your family. Let's honor the survivors. Let's remember the victims, their families, but also the families that they built and created after the war. It is now my pleasure to invite Lebo Ledwaba to play the theme from the film Schindler's List.
Paul Salmons is the chief curator of Seeing Auschwitz, an exhibition produced by Muse Alia for UNESCO and the United Nations, and co-curator of Muse Alia's international award-winning exhibition, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. Recently, he was consulting curator on two new permanent uh, Holocaust exhibitions that opened in New York City and St. Louis, Missouri. And he currently is working on a major new exhibition on the Berlin Wall. It is my pleasure for us to all welcome Paul Salmons. Thank you for that most kind introduction and um, thank you for inviting me, um, Tali Nates and uh, the center here and uh, for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for making it possible for me to, to visit South Africa uh, from the United Kingdom. Um, it's a real honor to be with you and to join you with you for this most moving commemoration. Um, I'd like to uh, explore with you uh, this evening the issue of remembrance and the value and the importance and the significance of remembering. Because I think this is something which um, actually is completely remarkable in the long history of uh, human atrocity. The many genocides that have happened throughout the ages. It's actually been something of a history of forgetting. The Holocaust is extraordinary and remarkable in being so well documented, so well researched, so well understood and um, so deeply remembered and actually has the beginnings of a, a whole new kind of culture of memory which has been extended to many other uh, genocides now since. But as I say, it's not something which should be taken for granted. And uh, every genocide, every mass atrocity is subject to deniers and to distorters and every genocide, even as it is unfolding, is indeed um, hidden by the perpetrators, uh, denied, and the evidence is destroyed. If we take the Holocaust as our paradigmatic example, in October of 1943, the leader of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, met in Poznan with a number of SS officers in that town's town hall, and he congratulated them on the mass murder of the Jews. He said to them that they had witnessed the murder of, the death of, the killing of um, so many people, but he described it as a page of glory in their history, but a page that would never be written. Because even as he spoke, those crimes were being covered up, the evidence was being destroyed, and he said that they would never speak of it outside of their circles. Now I mention that because the victims, even as this was happening, understood something of the oblivion which they faced. And if we move to Majdanek, we hear from uh, an inmate of Majdanek who said, to another inmate, history is usually written by the victors. What we know about murdered peoples is only what their murderers cared to say about them. Should our murderers be victorious, should they write the history, they may wipe out our history altogether as if we had never existed. Not even a dog will howl for us. This was Dr. Isaac Schipper, a historian, who himself perished in Majdanek, never knowing if his fate would be known, whether his name would be remembered, or whether his, he and his people faced, stood on the edge of utter oblivion. So our memory work is an attempt to restore them to us in some sense, to give them some dignity, to resist the efforts of the murderers, to, make them, to erase them completely from this earth. One of the ways we can do that 
is through the historical record, of course, through historical research, through commemoration and events such as today. But if I might reference this image, because it's also a photograph which appears in the exhibition upstairs, seeing Auschwitz, that's been mentioned several times this evening. This is a photograph taken by one of those perpetrators, uh, an SS cameraman. It comes from uh, a document known as the Auschwitz album or the Lily Jacob album. The reason why I turn to it is because I think in this one image we can see something of that effort by the perpetrators to erase those people, to obliterate them, because we are faced here with a, an enormous mound of shoes, just some of the possessions that trainloads of Jewish people had brought with them to Auschwitz. And if you look closely at this image, you'll notice even some details, though, that the cameraman wasn't really intending to capture. He's interested in the shoes and the sorting, the process of dealing with these possessions of the dead. But he captures, perhaps unwittingly, just in the background at the top, several chimneys, two chimneys from Crematoria 4, one partly hidden by the trees. And if you look further to the right of this image, there is also one of the chimneys of Crematoria 5. A little further to the right, behind the tree, is billowing smoke, which we can speculate most likely comes from the open pits where the bodies of the dead were being burned, those perhaps who had shortly before been wearing these shoes. The anonymity of a pile of shoes is something which would have suited that perpetrator's purpose. The objects which people brought with them were valued were recognized as having some value, everything people brought, not only the shoes which were destined to be uh, transported either back to Germany to be sold and uh, reused by German citizens or distributed to uh, German colonizers in the East, but also the things that people brought with them like pots and pans or hairbrushes, umbrellas, just the things of everyday life. Everything they brought with them had some value in the Nazis' eyes, except, of course, for one thing, which was their lives. They murder the people, they dispose of their bodies, and they keep these few things, this mass of anonymous shoes. So what is our work to do? What is our work in memory work? If we look into those shoes, we can pull out perhaps something of the individuality of these people. This is one shoe. We see one object, one small shoe, perhaps of a four or five year old child. And suddenly something of the individuality of that one victim is restored to us. Now in that mound of shoes, and there are hundreds and hundreds of shoes that were found at the end of the war, the liberation of Auschwitz and also of Majdanek, such camps. Many of these are displayed in exhibitions and museums around the world. A child's shoe, a woman's shoe, different ages, Different people are somehow identified through these otherwise anonymous objects. But the reason why I wanted to share the story of this one particular shoe is because it's the only one I've ever come across, the only one that I know of, that still retains its sock still tucked inside. That gives us another little insight into the owner of this one small object, this child who arrived at Auschwitz not understanding where he was, who was separated perhaps from his parents, other members of his community, who was pushed into the crematoria building and was told to undress, and was told 
as people were. Remember the number on your clothes peg so you can find your clothes quickly when you come back from your shower, the shower you're about to have. Tie your shoelaces together so they don't all get mixed up. So that you'll find them easily when you come back from your shower and you begin your new life here. This little boy, there's no lace even in the eyelets. Perhaps he was even too young to tie his own laces. Maybe a mother or father or older sibling would have done so at one time and he ran outside and played the same kind of games that we played when we were young children. But as he undressed, what we see is that he did what so many of us also did when we were children. If we went to a swimming pool and undressed and tucked our socks into our shoes so they didn't get lost, didn't get mixed up, or if we were about to play sport. Something of that child remains within the object. The child is gone. These artifacts, these precious objects, remain with us from that time. They're a tangible reminder of those people. They are a presence that remains with us from decades ago. And it's these sorts of objects that I wanted to share with you, just a few of them and a, and a few stories from the various work I've done over the years, from different exhibitions. There are different ways of remembering. And of course, they're not only from Auschwitz. Because the Holocaust, of course, was not only Auschwitz. This is a continent-wide genocide. This particular item, this woman's blouse, she is from hundreds of miles north of Auschwitz, some 60 miles north of Vilnius in German-occupied Lithuania. And it was owned by a woman called Raquel Porus. Raquel and her family were pushed into the ghetto of their hometown. And this was a gift that was presented to her by her sister, Haya, on her birthday. If you look closely at the blouse, you'll notice some delicate embroidery. In the ghetto, in those appalling conditions, Hyaporus sat and did this needlework with love, with care, with attention, as a gift for her sister. That also is not to be taken for granted, I think, in such appalling conditions, in extremis, that somehow people kept these family bonds, that somehow people kept some semblance of their lives going. So, when we had the opportunity to present this item, this object, this story, within our exhibition, which is an exhibition in New York, for me, at least, it presented something of a challenge. Because the question is actually, where do you place it within an exhibition, within a large exhibition, that tells a chronological and a thematic history of the Holocaust, such a complex story? Where does this item go? It could go in the ghetto section to tell the story of this sisterly love and this act of kindness, and this, this loving act. I think that's a very powerful story. It would certainly fit in that place. But the thing is, maybe there's a different story we should be telling. Maybe we should be really telling the story of Raquel herself who was a qualified nurse before the war. And she devoted so much time of her energy and her time to the care for the sick and the hungry, which again should not be taken for granted. Right? In, terms of, in times of such extremists, that people would help others. They would give something of themselves in those awful conditions to try to nurse the sick something of that humanity. So that could be our story. And in a large exhibition, there's only amount of, a certain amount of time to tell a story on one particular item. The thing is, there are other stories connected to this blouse because Rachel and Haya's family, together with the other Jews from that ghetto, were forced out and boarded a train, and they were told that they would be moving to the Vilnius ghetto some 60 miles away. But that was a lie, and the train was never bound for that ghetto. The train was actually bound uh, for the nearby forests of Pana. And Raquel Porus had this blouse with her 
when she and the other Jews from her hometown were lined up on the edge of mass pits, forced to strip and were shot into these mass graves where Rachel was murdered. Is that the story we should tell, the story of the Einsatzgruppe and the story of the murder of some one and a half million Jewish men, women and children, not in the death camps, the killing centers, but in these forests and ravines? Thing is, then how do we have the blouse? The reason we have the blouse, and I'll go back to the photograph of the shoes, is just as in that photograph, Jewish women were forced, in that, in that instance, to sort the possessions of the dead. So Jewish people were forced to sort the possessions of the dead in Pona. And one of those people was a friend of this family and recognized the blouse. And she somehow managed to smuggle it in a package to rescue it and to smuggle it into Vilnius. But actually, Haya, the woman who had embroidered it for her sister, had made her way, having jumped off that train. She was in the ghetto, and this blouse was, was restored to her, the blouse of her murdered sister. So is that the story? Or, going even further... This is the same blouse that Haya herself wore when she escaped the Vilnius ghetto and joined the partisans in the forests of Eastern Europe and fought the Germans, fought the Nazis and their collaborators with a group of partisans, some of 30,000 Jewish partisans who fought back, who took up arms. And this is the blouse that she wore in the forests in memory of her sister. And if I could show you a different image from this blouse, we could see the stitching that she did in the forest as this blouse tore and the repair that she made. And this is the blouse that she still owned and kept safe when she survived the Second World War, when she survived the Holocaust, and eventually took it with her to the United States and kept it in memory of her sister. And she entrusted that memory when she gave it to the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York and entrusted these stories to us as curators to try to do some measure of justice to them. And tonight I'd like to entrust her story and these stories of this object and the others that we'll look at to you. If we look at another, this one is connected with the story of a young man, Mendel Landau. Mendel Landau was born to a Hasidic family in uh, the town that he knew of as Oswinchim, uh, later, of course, known by the Germans as Auschwitz. When uh, Germany occupied Poland, Mendel Landau was forced from his home onto a forced labor project building roads, and later he was brought back to his hometown, but not to the town itself, but to the concentration camp of Auschwitz, which had been built there. And he uh, was forced as an inmate into Auschwitz-Birkenau, Auschwitz II Birkenau. And he was there at the same time as the photo was taken that I began with, that photograph from the summer of 1944, which is witness to the murder of the Hungarian Jews. And Landau saw a group of men from Hungary, still in their civilian clothes. As a deeply religious man, he was struck by n noticing these fringes at the bottom of this garment, this undershirt, this talit katan. And having done everything he could to try to observe the commandments, he now asked this stranger, this man from Hungary, might he just borrow this talit katan just for a short time? just so that he can wear it and observe a commandment and make a blessing. He saw this opportunity. He risked his life, because if he was witnessed, you know, there would be tremendously violent punishment. And he put on the shirt and he tried to make the blessing, but he was seen. An SS man saw what happened, 
and he beat him, he kicked him, he knocked him to the floor, he tore away this shirt, this talent katan, and he threw it like a piece of trash towards the wire and walked off and left Mendel Landau lying bleeding on the ground. And that man then risked his life a second time. As he didn't leave the, the shirt, the talit katan, where it lay, but rather he crawled over to this undergarment and brought it back because he wanted to return it to the owner that had lent it to him. That man who was new in Auschwitz, who had only just arrived, had witnessed all of this and wanted nothing to do with it. He didn't want this, this item to be returned to him. And so Mandel Landau kept this Talit Katan all his time through Auschwitz on the death march and he had it with him when he was liberated in Dachau at the end of the war and he took it to the United States. And he kept it still bloodstained from the beating that he received in Auschwitz. Include it here as a remarkable story in my eyes of another form of resistance. Just as we hear of that resistance or resilience of Rachel Porus in the ghetto tending the sick, that's a form of resistance. That agency, that resilience, or her sister Haya who joined the partisans and took up arms, a different form of resistance. Or here, a spiritual resistance where someone refuses to have their identity stripped away from them and preserves it even under those conditions, even at daily risk of death. What we're trying to do is to restore something of the individuality of those people that the Nazis wanted to render entirely anonymous. Many of the objects that we display in our work when we're dealing with the Holocaust or other genocides are so fundamentally different to those displayed in other museums and art galleries around the, around the world because mostly, most museums have tended to display the high points of human endeavor, the most wonderful art, the achievements of humankind, the greatest paintings. They're the things which we're proudest of about who we are. Our exhibitions don't present, on the whole, such objects. We present ordinary things, of ordinary people who are living through extraordinary times. An ordinary object such as a woolen blanket like this. Now when we see a blanket, when our visitors see a blanket, there's an association, right? There's, we all have these sorts of objects at home. You know, we put our blankets on our beds and we go to our bed as a place when we're tired, of course, at the end of the day, to rest, to sleep, or if we're sick, a place to huddle up and to take care of ourselves. Or it might be a place that you associate with childhood, being read stories, bedtime stories by your parents, or as an adult, a place where you hold your lover. We have associations with a bed, obviously. But what does a bed mean in Auschwitz where this was found, where this was used? A bed is a hard wooden bunk shared with many others, shared with the dead and the dying. And in those freezing conditions, this thin blanket is all that you have to keep yourself alive. But this particular blanket is one of thousands, tens of thousands of identical blankets, mass produced, nothing special except this one blanket was taken by a 24-year-old man, Siegfried Fedrid, snatched from his bunk when he and others were forced out of Auschwitz on a death march through the snow, hundreds of miles. And so this is the blanket which he wrapped around himself as others perished from the cold, fell by the wayside and were shot along the way through exhaustion. This is the blanket which kept him alive. And that, I would say, in itself is it's a powerful enough reason to display it. But there's something more. And again, this is, for me, totally remarkable. It's not something to be expected. This particular blanket, Siegfried Fedrid shared with four other men 
who also survived through his act of kindness, through his act of humanity, through his act of generosity, at a time when the purpose was to destroy everything about the human spirit, to degrade, to humiliate, not only to kill. These people kept something of themselves and of their dignity. And that resilience, that resistance, something else which I would like us to always try to, to honor and to remember. And the final object I'd like to share with you is something from the beginnings of my time working in the field of Holocaust education and Holocaust commemoration, Holocaust curation. And it's a, an object which was um, emerged when we were curating the Holocaust exhibition in London um, back in... I began working there in 1998. So this goes back to the beginnings of my, of my time working in this memory work. And it was something when I was, I mean, I specialized very much in education, working with teachers, with students, with educators. So the researcher who had obtained this, uh, this material, Kathy Jones, thought this might be of interest to me because clearly these are children's drawings. Might there be some connection here? So she invited me to look through this material with her. She hadn't had time to look at it in any detail. What we did know was that um, these are the drawings, the diaries, the poems of a young girl of just 12 years old, Doshia Fabiats, DF in the monogram at the top, who, with her family, with her mother, was forced into a ghetto in German-occupied Europe. But Doshia had a Christian friend, a Catholic girl called Marisha, MD, Marisha Dvorniak, in the uh, monogram at the top. They were best friends before the occupation. They remained friends during that time. So even in the ghetto, Marisha would sneak into the ghetto because not all of them were hermetically sealed by any means. She would enter the ghetto to play with her friend, to continue to whisper to each other, to tell each other stories, to um, make drawings together, to write poetry. This is what we have here. This is the, one of the objects from their friendship. She even continued to visit Doshia when she and her mother, Doshia and her mother, had to go into hiding in an attic in the ghetto with other Jewish people. Marisha knew where they were hiding, and she continued to visit. And Marisha was with her when they were discovered. She was with her when the ghetto was liquidated. She was with her when the Germans and their collaborators took these people from their hiding place. And those Jews in hiding begged that Marisha should be allowed to remain and told them, these killers, that she wasn't Jewish, that she was a Christian child. And remarkably, they agreed. They let her live. So she remained while Doshia, her mother, and those others were deported. And they're lost from sight now we, know, we don't know exactly what happened to them, but almost certainly they perished. What we're left with is this last trace of Mauritia, of Mauritia and Doshia's friendship. The last, perhaps, marks that Doshia ever made on the world, because she drew this drawing of these two girls together, and she wrote this poem. And Kathy Jones translated for me as she read aloud what I'm going to read to you now, the words on this page that Doshia wrote for Mauritia. When after friendship lasting years, we part and you've forgotten me, somewhere in a corner you'll find this little souvenir and you'll remember we were friends. You'll remember our special secrets the diary, the treasure box, 
our angry little scraps, and onto this book's pages a tear will fall, perhaps, perhaps. And as you turn each yellow page, you will recall when you were young and recollect those golden days so full of summer sun. She understood, it seems, what fate most likely awaited her. She also knew the possibility of the forgetting. She knew that they stood on the edge of this oblivion. And yet we do have these few reminders of these people. And it's an effort that we can make, I think, in our work to try to make that, that effort to give them something of themselves back, to restore something of their humanity and to see them with a dignity that was not afforded to them, of course, by their, their killers, by their murderers. So I want to thank you for being here and being part of that memory work, being part of that effort, because it, it mattered to them, which is why it should matter to us too. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that very sensitive um, presentation. Thank you. Um, we at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center have been very privileged to have Paul for two days now and um, he's been speaking to us. And I'm so glad that many of you also have had the, the wonderful opportunity to listen to Paul speaking uh, to us. Thank you very much. Um, at this point in time, uh, it is again my privilege to call upon Director Jane Walter, Director of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation to address us. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for the opportunity to deliver my words of gratitude on today's annual commemoration of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day on the tomorrow 78th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Furthermore, I would like to thank the following persons in particular. Irene Feynman, Irene Klaas, Eddie Wender, Reverend Joseph Metzner, Helene Seif, Helene Lehmann, and Leah Stürmer for being here today and for the deeply touching candle lighting ceremony. Thank you very much. Also, special thanks to His Excellency Eli Belozekowski, His Excellency Andreas Peschke, Mr. Masimba, Tafi Renjika, ambassadors, members from the Diplomatic Corps, and special thanks to Paul Sermons and Libo Ledwaba for the excellent and deeply touching contributions tonight. Also, a special thanks to Mark Klein Productions, who volunteers to do all the setup for the event. Thank you for your generosity. The Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is honored to be part of this partnership with the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and the United Nations Information Center, Pretoria. As a German political foundation, we see it as our duty and responsibility to keep the memory alive about the uniquely horrific crime without precedent in human history. Commemoration and remembrance are obviously were very important in that regard. Although since 1996, the day of liberation of Auschwitz has been an official day of remembrance in the Federal Republic of Germany, nevertheless, according to a relatively recent survey, four out of 10 students aged 14 and older do not know what to make of the name Auschwitz. This underlines the importance of the commemoration of the day of liberation of Auschwitz, but it also emphasizes the need for education, especially in Germany, and I'm very grateful that His Excellency Andreas Peschke named a few important programs 
but it is necessary, necessary everywhere in the world. And therefore, I believe that the work of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center cannot be appreciated highly enough. Also, I would like to thank the whole team of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center to facilitate this crucial commemoration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lebo, once again. And I think many of us can um, remember the title of that song, which is Imagine. And perhaps all of us can allow ourselves to imagine a world where humanity lives in peace and is at peace with itself. So maybe we can try and imagine. So thank you for that, Lebo. That was beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Ambassador Belotekovsky, thank you. Ambassador Peshka, thank you. Siabonga. <laughs> ambassadors, deputy ambassadors, and members of the diplomatic corps in South Africa from various embassies that are represented here tonight, thank you very much for taking the time to travel to be here. Thank you very much. Directors, Director Tali Nates, Director Mr. Masimba Daferenyiga. Director Jane Walter, Mr. Paul Salmons, our dear Holocaust survivors, thank you for taking the time and the strength to be here today and to participate in this very special event. Um, and also, thank you, Lebo, the very talented Lebo Ledwaba. Thank you very much for, for blessing us with the music. Our dear volunteers, Mark Klein, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to you all, our supporters and our public, 
for continuing to support and attend our events. We really, really appreciate that. Before you leave tonight, I would like to ask you to please take the time to go upstairs and view the exhibition Seeing Auschwitz, curated by Paul Salmons. It will be here at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center until the end of March. So, um, and also, so if not tonight, but other days, please take the time to come and visit us. Be safe and be peaceful. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.